Hello, uh, I am Kyle Claret from the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, and I have been asked to introduce my esteemed colleague, friend, and mentor, Dr. Rick Nishimura. You are in for a real treat, as Dr. Nishimura will now present valvular heart disease, what the non-cardiologist needs to know. Thanks, Rick. Well, th thanks very much, Kyle. Uh, very kind of you. What I want to do is talk to you about what the non-cardiologist needs to know about valvular heart disease in 2021. I have no disclosures for this, except my one disclosure is that I'm not a cardiac surgeon, I'm not an interventionist, and I'm not an imager. So basically what you're gonna hear is perspectives from a plain old cardiologist. Now let's go into talk about what has changed in the management of valvular heart disease since ma many of you were taking your boards or have been in residency, so on and so forth. And for the residents, you need to know this for the boards that you're gonna be taking over the next couple of years. What has changed is number one, indications for intervention. Number two, the type of intervention. And at the very end, we'll go over a few case histories where we're gonna talk about the evolving practice of valvular heart disease and what's changed in the recent 2020 guidelines. And let's start with this case. So we've got a 55 year old man, 54 year old man who comes for an executive examination. And with this executive examination, you find out that the guy's completely asymptomatic, he's active and has no other medical problems. But now when we say an executive examination, Let's go into that in more detail and actually examine the patient Be because it's this old fashioned stethoscope of yours is where you're gonna really pick up these valvular heart disease cases. And what you'll be seeing in the next few minutes is the fact that even if they're asymptomatic, it's gonna be incredibly important for you to be able to diagnose them. Now, this is similar to the patient that was presented. The auscultation, shows a three over six late peaking systolic ejection, remember the right upper sternal border with a fourth heart sound, venous pressure is normal, but the major thing that you see and feel is that the carotid upstroke has both parvus and tardis. No other medical problems here. So of course, the next thing you do is you go get your echocardiogram and Dr. Klerich might read this echocardiogram as saying, well, the ejection fraction is normal. There's left ventricular hypertrophy there, but there's severe aortic stenosis, mean gradient of 44 millimeter of mercury. And we'll talk about what these numbers mean in just a minute. My aortic valve area, 0 0.9 centimeter squared, normal mitral valve and normal aorta. Now I want to be able to get um, your intake as to what is going on here. And I, I would like to ask you what you would do in this type of a situation. Would you follow up in six months? Would you do a transcatheter aortic valve implantation? Would you do a surgical aortic valve replacement? Or would you put the person on a treadmill test? And we did pull some of the audience beforehand and the majority of them said what we would probably do in the past, asymptomatic, pretty active, not doing very much, let's go ahead and follow them up. So what we're gonna talk about now are the indications for intervention on this very common valve disease, which is aortic stenosis. And if we go back to the old school of thought, the natural history of aortic stenosis is shown in this, this very, very old drawing by Ross and Brownwell back in the 1960s, where a person would do very, very well until they had the onset of symptoms. Once they have the onset of symptoms, then it's angina, syncope, or heart failure. And at that time, we had these old-fashioned valves, ball cage valves, tissue valves made out of bovine pericardium or pig valves, as they would say. And at that time, we would always weigh the risk of the operation versus the risk of the operation versus the risk of the intervention. Now, the risk of the operation are the consequences of the operative intervention, which is valve deterioration, bleeding, infection, and the risk of the procedure itself. In the risk of the oper observation, it's the consequences of the untreated valve disease, which in this case would be heart failure 
or death. And at that time, if surgeons would take these patients to the operating room back uh, several decades ago, there would be a very high operative risk of eight to 10%. And with these old fashioned valves, there would be an adverse outcome that 50% would either embolize or bleed with these high INRs that you would require at 10 years. And if you had a tissue valve, about 50% of them would deteriorate. So because of that, when we were talking about the patient with asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis, the godfather of cardiology, Dr. Eugene Brownwell, used to tell us, well, the most common cause of death in the patient with the asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis is an operation. And that's the way we practiced. And back a few years ago, if we were asked, what is the indication for any type of intervention in a patient with severe aortic stenosis, it would be mainly that of symptoms. But what we started to do is we started to look at the outcome of these patients who had severe aortic stenosis but were asymptomatic. And Dr. Pelica from our own institution did this natural history study and showed that if these patients, even if they were asymptomatic, were followed, at five years, three out of four patients would either have had heart failure or die. So they were asymptomatic. We followed them, but they had a poor outlook if left untreated. And the question is, is why? So what I want to do now is take you through some pathophysiology on what happens to these patients with aortic stenosis and how we've changed our school of thought. So a person starts out with mild to moderate aortic stenosis, gradients usually less than 40, then they develop severe stenosis. And we have defined severe stenosis as gradients greater than 40 millimeter of mercury or valve area less than one centimeter squared. And it was thought that these patients who develop severe stenosis would develop compensatory hypertrophy, which would normalize the wall stress and this would allow this compensation for the patients to do very, very well for years until the onset of symptoms and boom, something would happen. Now we've changed that school of thought and our new paradigm is this, is that you have start well with mild to moderate stenosis, you go to severe stenosis and then you start to develop your compensatory hypertrophy, but at the time you develop compensatory hypertrophy, there's a lot of other things going on. And if you look at the natural history, instead of waiting till symptoms, there is a gradual decrease in the survival in these patients, even at the onset of compensatory hypertrophy. And what is happening in those patients is they're actually developing myocardial damage from this longstanding pressure overload. And then at some point in time, they drop their ejection fraction even before the onset of symptoms. And then finally they develop symptoms. But one can see from this, that if you wait for symptoms to develop, you're actually waiting too long. Now, what I want the residents to understand and all of our fellows is we're currently staging these patients now. And you should use the stage just like we use in heart failure, which tells you what these patients have, where they are and what you should do with them. So for instance, stage B are those patients with mild to moderate aortic stenosis. Nothing needs to be done except meticulous follow-up. Stage D is severe stenosis to have the onset of symptoms. Stage C2 is severe aortic stenosis. They're asymptomatic, but they've already shown that their ventricle is damaged because their ejection fraction has started to drop. Stage C1 the group of patients that we are going to be most concerned about are those patients who, number one, have severe stenosis, gradient greater than 40 or a valve area less than one, but they've already started to develop compensatory hypertrophy and may also have started to develop myocardial damage. Now we follow these patients in stage B, you definitely operate them in stage D once they have the onset of symptoms, you definitely operate with severe aortic stenosis, even asymptomatic once they drop their ejection fraction. But the big question is what do we do these patients with stage C1? Their severe stenosis, their ejection fraction is preserved, and they're asymptomatic. Now we're gonna to add to the equation the fact 
that now our surgeons can operate on these patients with a much lower operative risk. Instead of five, eight, 10% operative risk, a young man, 60 year old with an isolated aortic valve should be able to have an aortic valve replacement with a risk of less than 1%. And we've got great valves now. We've got these mechanical valves that the INR used to be at 3.5, can be down to two or even a little less than two. The embolic events, the bleeding risk is less than 1% per year. We've got third generation tissue valves, which can last 10, 15, 20 years. And as we'll talk about a little bit later, we have TAVI. So not only are we worried about waiting too long on these patients, but we now have interventions that can be done with a low upfront risk and an excellent long-term outcome. So let's go back to this natural history that we're talking about with this new paradigm and look further at the stage C1 and try to find out when that compensatory hypertrophy starts to kind of cause this myocardial damage, which is eventually going to cause a decrease in survival long term. And the reason to have this red arrow here is because we have a number of trials, some of which are randomized, some of which are cohort trials, but they are giving you clues that this patient, even if they're asymptomatic, even if their ejection fraction is normal, are not going to do well. And probably at that time have started to develop myocardial damage. So you put them on a treadmill. If they drop their blood pressure on the treadmill and they only go 60%, beware. If they have very severe aortic stenosis, if their gradient is greater than 60 millimeter of mercury, beware. We now have biomarkers. And if their BNP is greater than three times normal, it means their diastolic filling is abnormal, beware. And even though we used to say that an ejection fraction less than 50% was a bad sign, we're finding now that if you start out at 70 or 75% ejection fraction, and over time you see it go to 70, go to 65, go to 58%, that is a bad sign and you worry. And finally, there's the rapid progression with an increase in aortic velocity of 0.3 meter per second per year. So what is happening now is in this new paradigm, yes, we still operate in patients with severe aortic stenosis if they're symptomatic. And we still operate if their ejection fraction is less than 50%, but we really want to try to get to these patients before they start to develop this incipient myocardial damage. So class 2A indications, very severe aortic stenosis, positive treadmill, high BNP, rapid progression, drop in ejection fraction. So we do more in these patients. And the one that I showed you, we're going to put on a treadmill. And if the blood pressure drops on the treadmill, we're going to go ahead and we're going to recommend aortic valve replacement. Or we're going to draw a BNP, and if that BNP is up three times normal, it means that they're just teetering on the edge, and that patient should require aortic valve replacement. So it is a different indication with a lower threshold for intervention on these patients. Now, next, let's turn to mitral regurgitation. This is another very common cause of a heart murmur, valvular heart disease that we all see in our practice and you see in your practice. And I know that because you've just sent about three patients my way over the past week. So now we talk about primary mitral regurgitation, which is a disease of the valve itself. We go through this survival time curve where you go from mild to moderate regurge to severe regurge. Now we have compensatory dilatation of the ventricle, myocardial damage, drop in ejection fraction, and the onset of symptoms. Just some numbers. We now are measuring how severe the mitral regurgitation is by something called effective orifice area. So if your effective orifice area is greater than 0.4 centimeters squared, that's going to be severe. Compensatory dilatation means LV enlargement. If your ejection fraction is less than 60% or your end systolic dimension is greater than 40, that means your ejection fraction is dropped. And again, they can have symptoms of angina, dyspnea, or even syncope, and we're going to put them in the stages. So stage B, we're going to watch. Stage D, we're going to operate. Stage C, we're going to operate. 
But again, we want to take a look at this stage C1 because that is a problem with mitral regurgitation. And the reason it's a problem is because especially in the regurgitant lesions, the onset of myocardial damage is unpredictable in mitral regurgitation. And this myocardial damage actually happens much, much earlier than what happens in the patient with pressure overload from aortic stenosis. And we've seen a number of patients who come with severe mitral regurgitation that we think are doing okay, but we operate on them and their ejection fraction drops dramatically following the operation and stays down which means their prognosis for the future becomes much, much worse. Now, again, we're going to weigh the fact we want to intervene earlier with the fact that we have greater interventions. And in mitral regurgitation, this is, a, this is an area that Mayo Clinic surgeons have led the nation in performing mitral valve repair rather than mitral valve replacement. Repair means you go in, you take the person's own valve, you kind of do some ligations, you do some stitches, you put in annuloplasty rings, and at the end you have the patient's own mitral valve. And most of the time there's very minimal mitral regurgitation. The operative risk is less than 1% in experienced centers like Mayo with superb long-term outcomes. And our own group has looked at the fact that if you have a successful valve repair in a patient whose ejection fraction is normal, the survival is actually comparable to that of a normal population. So if you get to these patients early enough, their outlook for the future can be excellent. We also know that early surgery is better than watchful waiting if in fact you can do a successful mitral valve repair. So the paradigm in primary mitral regurgitation is such that you weigh the risk of operation. And if you can do a mitral valve repair, it can be done at a very, very low risk with an excellent long-term outcome versus the risk of observation and the consequences of untreated valve disease and mitral regurgitation that we're worried about most is the left ventricular dysfunction that occurs just under our eyes without us even knowing. And because of that, if in fact, our surgeons can look at a valve that has severe mitral regurgitation and tell us that they can do a valve repair with a greater than 95% certainty and a risk than less than 1%, we go ahead and send them to surgery, irrespective of how big the ventricle is, irrespective of whether or not they have symptoms in order to prevent the adverse long-term consequences of this long-standing volume overload. So for the residents in the audience, remember when you're taking your boards, if you have severe primary mitral regurgitation, class one, symptoms for sure operate, ejection fraction less than 60% operate. But if in fact you've got a patient who's got severe mitral regurgitation due to a primary abnormality, and if in fact, you can get a durable repair at a low risk. You operate on these patients in order to prevent the long-term adverse out, uh, consequences. So what has changed in the management of patients with valvular heart disease? The indication for operation dramatically changed. We want a lower threshold before the onset of damage to the left ventricle if low risk and good outcome. Now, what does that mean for you as non-cardiologists I think it's very simple. You examine the patient. The stethoscope that you have is so important in identifying patients with murmurs. And even though they're asymptomatic now in 2021, we want to identify those patients who have significant valve disease. We want to pursue the findings of a heart murmur aggressively because we may be saving them from eventual long-term deterioration of their left ventricle. And that's indications for intervention. Now, let's switch gears. 2021, a brand new era of type of interventions. And what I'm showing you here is TAVI. TAVI is transcatheter aortic valve implantation. I remember before, in order to treat aortic stenosis, the open heart surgery, put them on cardiopulmonary bypass, completely replace the valve. 
there are select patients in whom you can go in with a catheter, put the catheter across the valve, it kind of blow up a balloon with a valve wrapped around the catheter, balloon comes down and voila, you have a brand new valve in place, a dramatic relief of obstruction within seconds. Now there's some caveats here. This isn't the magic answer for anything, for every patient with aortic stenosis or aortic valve disease, but certainly has significantly changed the way we look upon these patients. Now, I want to take you through just um, some historical aspect of TAVI so you can understand where we've been and what we're doing now. Now, when TAVI first came out, there was a lot of concern. People said, we're not going to be able to put these big valves across, uh, big artificial valves across these very calcified valves. Things can break off. You can get a stroke. We can explode the annulus. Um, the valves will slip out. So the companies started doing randomized trials first in the very high-risk patients. And it's these randomized trials that have actually completely changed the way that we think about how we're going to do things in a short period of time. So the first randomized trial with a TAVI was in inoperable patients. And we found that TAVIs are much better than medical therapy in these patients. And then they went to high-risk patients, uh, kind of as a risk of greater than 8 or 9% operative risk, and found that TAVI was similar to surgical aortic valve replacement. So just six years ago, TAVI came into play and said, well, we're going to put them in an inoperable patients, and we're going to have a shared decision-making in high-risk patients. Then further trials came out with intermediate-risk patients, patients whose operative risk would say be between maybe three to 8% and randomized patients to either a TAVI or surgical aortic valve replacement and found there was a very comparable outcome in those patients. So we went down to intermediate risk patients. And then finally, in our most recent guidelines, they've done trials extending to low risk patients in which TAVI and select patients is very comparable to surgical aortic valve replacement. And what patient wouldn't want to get a catheter rather than open heart surgery. So we've extended down to low risk patients. Now it's a little bit more complicated because we can't put TAVIs in everybody. And there's a few things that we as cardiologists need to remember as we speak to your patients coming to us with aortic stenosis who need an intervention. And you should understand this too, so you can help back up. But remember our surgical aortic valves. We have mechanical and we have tissue. Now, the mechanical valves have really gotten to be very, very good. They last forever. They never wear out. And actually, in younger patients, perhaps those between 55 and 60 or younger, there's actually a survival benefit in these younger patients. The INR can be less and less and less, lower and lower and lower. They're longer lasting. So if we put a mechanical valve in, let's say, a 55-year-old, we would assume that this is going to last for the rest of this guy's life, and he's never going to need another operation. Whereas the TAVI, remember, is a tissue prosthesis, and we still don't know the long-term outcome beyond five to eight years. So we, we're, we still have a balancing act here. And in every patient that comes, we do a shared decision-making process of what we know, what we don't know. But the age is important and the number of years they have left is important. And the younger people who have a good 15 to 20 years, I think a mechanical valve is probably the best approach to them. You might have an 80-year-old person who might have a good eight to 10 years, in that case, a tissue valve, and even then a TAVI might be the best approach. No cutoffs. You, you, you know, we're not going to put people in the boxes, but we're going to do a shared decision-making process that Victor Montori always says to give the pros and cons of each type of valve, tissue versus mechanical, TAVI versus SAVR, find out the patient's own needs, their own preferences, and we can come to a mutual decision, and that's TAVI versus SAVR. So what has changed? Indications for intervention, lower threshold before the onset of left ventricular dysfunction, the type of intervention. Remember, we do have some catheter-based interventions in selected patients. Now, what I want to then turn to 
and there's more examples of different areas of your practice that are evolving. And I'll do that through kind of cases here and let you figure out what you might want to do. So these are common patients that you'll see in your practice, either in general medicine or as a subspecialist who might have a cardiac patient coming to you um, uh, at the same time that you're seeing them for either their general medical evaluation or your subspecialty. So let's start out with something like this, because this has changed over the years. Um, and, and thanks to Larry Badur and Walt Wilson and really clarifying this for us, but it's made our life a lot easier. So what patient scenario should have infective endocarditis prophylaxis prior to a procedure? Mechanical AVR for screening colonoscopy, past mitral valve repair for dental cleaning, or a bicuspid aortic valve with moderate aortic regurgitation for teeth removal. Okay, let's have you think about that. See what you would say. We've had a number of people respond and most say a mechanical aortic valve for screening colonoscopy should have infective endocarditis prophylaxis. Now, let me say this, is that the ACCHA has got these great guidelines and we put a lot of work into these guidelines and there's like 500 or 600 pages of what our experts feel is the best approach. But in these guidelines, you gotta go pull them down from the web and you got to find the right guideline. You got to find the most updated guideline because we have guidelines in 2014, 2016, 2017, 2020. We've got to then scroll through hundreds of pages. So what's a busy clinician like you supposed to do? And Kyle mentioned that is Mayo Clinic has this whole team working on getting the right information to you quickly at the point of care and that's Mayo, Ask Mayo Expert. And if you go in the Ask Mayo Expert and punch in infective endocarditis, you see this beautiful care process model. But just to summarize it for you, at this point in time, IE prophylaxis is only for dental procedures, not for colonoscopy, not for anything else, and only for prosthetic valves, including TABI, prosthetic material, including clips and rings, or prior infective endocarditis. Now there's other things like congenital heart disease that we never worry about, but if you just remember this, you're gonna save yourself a lot of hassle from giving infective endocarditis prophylaxis to native valves or procedures that are not dental procedures. Let's go on. Now here's a 65 year old prior St. Jude's aortic valve replacement placed four years ago, okay, coming for a total hip arthroplasty asymptomatic, normal ejection fraction, INR is 2.2. What needs to be done prior to his surgery? Okay, so he's on warfarin, INR 2.2. Your orthopod wants him off that anticoagulant stuff. So are you gonna say the risk of elective THA is too high, cancel the surgery? Are you gonna stop the warfarin, let the INR drift down, do a THA when the INR is less than 1.5, stop the warfarin, low molecular weight heparin when the INR is less than two, stop the warfarin, hospitalize for unfractionated heparin when the INR is less than two, and then when less than 1.5, go ahead and do the surgery. Think about this, and let's see what you would do in your own practice. Now, when we polled the residents, most of them said, stop the warfarin, give low molecular weight heparin, protect that valve, and then when the INR is less than two, go ahead and stop it and, and have the orthopod do his total hip arthroplasty. But again, let's go to Ask Mayo Expert. One of the things that you should look at is this periprocedural anticoagulation management calculator. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, Brian Newman put it together. We knew everybody was asking questions. When do I stop my DOAC? You know, when do I stop my apixaban? When do I stop my warfarin if it's atrial fibrillation? What about if it's for hip surgery? What about if it's for neurologic surgery? And this is a beautiful calculator that is an Ask Mayo expert that'll tell you exactly what day to stop this, um, depending on what the surgery is and what day the operation is gonna be. And you put in all this stuff and you calculate. But bottom line is this for prosthetic valves. You're gonna put your prosthetic valves into low risk, which is a newer mechanical AVR, normal sinus rhythm, normal left ventricle, no prior emboli, or high risk, all other valves. 
Now, if you have a low risk valve, this mechanical AVR, normal sinus rhythm, normal ejection fraction, no prior embolic event, you don't need the bridge. Stop the warfarin, let the INR drift down. Once it gets to the level the orthopod wants it, operate, restart the warfarin the night before, but don't bother bridging because you don't have to. Now, if they're high risk, stop the warfarin, INR less than two. This is when you bridge with low molecular heparin as an outpatient or unfractionated heparin as an inpatient and you operate and then you restart again. So a simplistic approach, but it'll save you a lot of hassle with your patients as we do this. Now let's go a little bit more into valvular heart disease, some native valve disease. 76 year old man presents with six months of heart failure symptoms. He has a past history of a dilated cardiomyopathy with an ejection fraction of 30% on an ACE inhibitor and diuretic. Now has severe mitral regurgitation on echo. Blood pressure's up a bit, heart rate's 84. What do we do? Optimize guideline directed medical therapy. You could add a beta blocker. You might want to consider a bivy pacer. Send for surgical valve repair because he's got severe mitral regurgitation. Or we've got some of these balloonatics in our lab, like Dr. Rehal, who can put a clip in and make that mitral regurgitation better. And as we polled people, we found that a lot of them would send them to Dr. Rehal to just put this clip in percutaneously. And here's the mitral clip. It's a new treatment for mitral regurgitation. It goes in through the vena cava, through, an atrial septal, uh, through the atrial septum, and you clip two leaflets of the mitral valve, and it actually is quite effective. But the one overlying caveat that you have to remember about mitral regurgitation is this. You divide mitral regurgitation whenever you see it into either primary, which is a disease of the valve, or secondary, which is a disease of the ventricle. Primary disease of the valve is what we had talked about before. If you have severe mitral regurgitation, it's valvular, that ventricle is going to get worse and worse and worse. You're going to operate earlier and earlier and earlier. But if it's secondary disease of the ventricle and a degenerative of the uh, a primary valve is either the mitral valve prolapse or rheumatic, but the secondary is either a dilated cardiomyopathy or an ischemic cardiomyopathy. These are diseases of the ventricle. They're not diseases of the valve. So what you wanna do first is you wanna treat the ventricle. And most of these patients will actually respond to medical therapy. Their heart failure will go away. Their mitral regurgitation will get much better. And you might clip only if responsive to treatment of the left ventricle itself. Let's keep on going for just a few more minutes. 55 year old woman, St. Jude's aortic valve with aortic root replacement, no other medical problems. She comes to you now and says, what, what do I need to be on in terms of this anticoagulation? What INR do I need? And do I need aspirin? So we've got an INR of 2.5 plus an aspirin, INR 1.5 to 2 plus an aspirin, INR of 2.5 alone. What should we do? Well, let's look here. And the majority of people said INR 2.5 and aspirin. And that used to be the right answer. But what has happened in the recent guidelines if we've been back, we've looked at the literature, and unless you're using aspirin for another indication, aspirin is no longer needed in a younger patient with a valve prosthesis. So anticoagulation for mechanical prosthesis, again, we're going to put them in low risk and high risk. Low risk patients, go for that INR at 2.5, one goal. Some of the newer uh, 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 valves like an onyx valve, you can even go lower to 1.5 to 2. Now, high risk, INR 3.0. And remember, we're not giving ranges. We're giving a single one to go through, and that's going to help you throughout in your management. Now, here's another one in which things have changed. The 67-year-old, bioprosthetic aortic valve three years ago, now only on aspirin. He now has new onset atrial fibrillation asymptomatic with the CHADS2 vascular 3. What is the optimal treatment to prevent embolic events? Uh, do we add a Pixaban? But he's got a prosthetic valve. Do we add warfarin or do we 
give them dual antiplatelet agents. And again, this is something that's new too. And as we asked, most people were split between warfarin and apixaban. Now, the reason that they were split is because when the NOAX first came out, they were um, uh, uh, touted as optimal treatment for prevention of thromboembolic events in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. But nobody knew what non-valvular was. So as we've gone through the literature, non-valvular means that you can use NOAX with native aortic valve disease, mitral valve disease, tricuspid valve disease, and tissue valves. You'll only need warfarin for rheumatic mitral stenosis and mechanical valves. We've got a couple more cases here. I'll quickly present them. We'll open it up to questions, but I think this is a good one because here's a 72-year-old woman who's had permanent atrial fibrillation and a permanent pacemaker, presents with increasing right heart failure, edema, and ascites. You walk in the room, you see these neck veins going, whoa, 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 but there's no murmur. What would you do? Add an ACE inhibitor, an aldosterone antagonist, tricuspid valve operation, or sildenafil therapy. Most people would want to treat for heart failure. Now, what this patient has that you can tell with these big neck veins is severe tricuspid regurgitation. You can make that diagnosis by looking at the neck. Now, in the past, we used to think it was all due to either pulmonary hypertension or dilated cardiomyopathy, and you treat the underlying etiology. But now, and you're going to see this, you're going to see patients come in with isolated, severe tricuspid regurgitation, either due to the fact they got a device lead or they have atrial fibrillation. And those patients, because they have primary tricuspid valve disease, will respond to either a surgical procedure and we have percutaneous options. So if you have a patient who has severe right heart failure and they have huge neck veins, think of severe TR. And even in the absence of a murmur, think about treating that, particularly if they have atrial fibrillation or device leads. One last thing here. I just want to get this point across because this is an area that people um, are scared of, but they need to know what's going on. 24-year-old mechanical carbomedics MVR. Guess what? She's eight weeks pregnant. She's on warfarin, four milligrams per day with an INR or 2.4. You've been taught this in medical school. You've been taught this before. What would you do now? Switch to low molecular weight heparin. Continue the warfarin. Stop warfarin until the second trimester. We're wondering about it. warfarin embryopathy. We're wondering about valve thrombosis. Most people would switch to low molecular weight heparin, but don't. The management of mechanical prosthetic valves in pregnancy, the old school of thought was don't use warfarin in the first trimester because of warfarin embryopathy. But the current school of thought based on new data is that if the dose of warfarin is less than five milligrams, it's safest to continue in the first trimester because other anticoagulants are poor and lead to a very high risk of valve thrombosis. If you are going to use low molecular weight heparin, do not use weight adjusted. It has to be meticulous control of the dosage using factor 10A levels to adjust. More of this is in AME. More of this is in the guidelines. But it's a new way of thinking about anticoagulation of these valves for the pregnant woman. So in valvular heart disease, what has changed indications for intervention? Remember, now we want a lower threshold to prevent the adverse consequences of valve disease. We now have type of interventions. We've got great surgical interventions. We've got mitral valve repair, and we've got catheter-based interventions. And I've just given you a little potpourri of the evolving practice that we have now and how things have changed over the years that you can find in the ACCHA guidelines as well as Ask Mayo Expert. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Nishimura. We'll transition to the Q&A. For those watching, if you'd like to submit a question, you can do so on slido.com, and our event code is still MGR20, non-case sensitive. Dr. Nishimura, we do have several questions that came in during the presentation. Um, the first, is it possible to predict which mitral valve replacement patients will have decreased EF and poor postoperative outcomes? 
Yeah, that's a that's a very good question because the majority of patients who have a mitral valve replacement will drop their ejection fraction as you're um, kind of decreasing that pop-off valve to a low pressure left atrium. And you can't predict which ones are going to have the decreased ejection fraction, which is why you want to be able to operate earlier and earlier and earlier. And it's that exact, that exact question as to why, if your valve can be repaired, you go ahead no matter what the left ventricle looks like. Thank you. Next question, with prosthetic valves, just a confirmation or question that low molecular weight heparin can be used for bridging at this point. Yeah, so for pregnant patients, as we just said, you do not want to use low molecular weight heparin if at all possible, and you have to. You can only do it if you have factor 10A levels, keeping between about 0.8 and 1.2. Most of your valves are going to be your newer generation aortic valve prosthesis, in which case you're not going to need bridging. But if you do need bridging for just a couple days, then it would be appropriate to use low molecular weight heparin. And if it's just a couple days and they're not at very, very high risk, you can do it weight-based. Thank you. And really an add-on question. Um, what about the young woman who presents with either severe AS or MR who wants to still have a family in pregnancy? Uh, very difficult. About a two-hour conversation with the patient. Um, we, we actually have a group of um, people who um, have an expertise in pregnancy and heart disease uh, they will sit down with the patient. They'll go over the pros and cons of going ahead um, uh, with the pregnancy, either with an intervention or without an intervention, but it's so complicated that you can't make a sweeping statement as, as to what you would do. But I would definitely get them to have the two-hour conversation with the experts going over the needs and preferences of the patients, pros and cons of operating beforehand or whatever. Thank you. Switching gears, can DOAX be used for three months after TAVR or TAVI instead of warfarin? Um, right now, the answer is no. Whoever uh, wrote that question actually knows a lot what's going on because we used to, because ta the TAVI valves do have a tendency to have a thin layer of thrombus go over, and that's been one of the downsides. We've been trying to get rid of that with either warfarin, antiplatelet agents, or DOAX. There was one trial that came out about a year ago that actually said that the mortality was increased if you use DOAX. We don't know why, but because of that, the warning now is we can't use DOAX the first three months after a TAVI at this point in time. But I will tell you that the new ACC uh, trials that are gonna come out in the next month are going to have another couple trials um, which are looking at that exact same question, and hopefully we'll have better answers, which will then put an ASMAO expert for you. Thank you. Next question. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've heard this is quite controversial. Do you believe that severe isolated tricuspid regurgita uh, regurgitation causes right-sided pleural effusions? I, I didn't catch the last side, la, last sentence, Karma. Do I believe it causes? Yeah, whether whether you believe that severe isolated tricuspid regurgitation causes right pleural effusions. Um, I think it can cause the right pleural effusions when your liver gets so big um, and you get ascites there and it leaks through. So the answer is yes. Congestive hepatopathy. Thank you. And switching gears again to another perioperative question, with the new paradigm, should patients with severe asymptomatic aortic valve stenosis be referred to TAVR prior to an elective surgery, or should we consider the perioperative management differently with the new guidelines? Okay, very, very good question. First of all, TAVI has not been studied in asymptomatic patients. So we would not want an asymptomatic patient to get a TAVI. We, we only want to get TAVIs in patients in, uh, who've been studied for it. So an asymptomatic takes TAVI out of the question. But then there's the question on whether or not you can get a patient through surgery with asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis. And again, that takes a lot of um, thought 
uh, and, and dependent on many other things such as you, you know, what is their ventricular function, if they have concomitant coronary artery disease, how severe the aortic stenosis is. So no cut and dry answer, but certainly something that you need to really delve into deeper before you just send them for the surgery. Thank you. We have time for just a couple more questions. The next question, aside from the mitral clip, are there any percutaneous mitral valve replacement options coming in the future or near future? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got a, a group of um, uh, young hotshots in our laboratory. Um, Myra uh, Guerrero is kind of running them with Macalid and Al Cooley and um, uh, Chet Rehal, but there is a mitral valve replacement percutaneously um, that is being studied right now that has great promise for the future. Thank you. And this will be the last question. A comment on TAVI and functional oct octogenarians, especially stage C1 disease. Yeah, so C1, remember, remember, means that they're asymptomatic. And if they're asymptomatic, we do not have the data yet to say that we should be doing TAVI. So if you're going to want to do something for a C1 patient, it's going to have to be a surgical approach. Very good question. Bill and here and Dr. Nishimura, we'd like to thank you for the excellent lecture, the clinical pearls, and teaching us about the new guidelines. We've really appreciated it this afternoon. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Carmel.